In this video, we'll talk about the standard level content from C3.1 on integration of body systems, and we'll be looking at how all of these systems are controlled by feedback loops. Now, when we say feedback loops, what we mean are a series of inputs and responses, okay? And so let's take a look at our blood pH as an example of that. Now, the normal pH of our blood is about 7.35 to 7.45. It's slightly basic. When we have an increase in activity, that is going to mean more muscle movement, which means we need more ATP, which means we're going to be doing more cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is a product of cell respiration, so that also means we're going to have more carbon dioxide in our blood plasma. When carbon dioxide dissolves in water, like in our blood plasma, that is going to drive down the pH, okay? That creates an acid when dissolved. So that drop in pH, okay, causes nerve signals to be passed to our muscles that control our breathing. So dangling down from our brain in that medulla oblongata, we have these things called chemoreceptors. They're sitting right here in our carotid artery, and those chemoreceptors are sensing the pH in the blood. When they sense that, they send nerve signals to the muscles involved in breathing and ventilation, okay? And it causes the ventilation rate to increase. So like during exercise, when we have a lot of activity, that is why we are breathing more deeply and we're breathing more frequently. This is an example of a negative feedback loop because as soon as that blood pH returns to normal homeostatic levels, then that breathing rate will go back down, okay? So it's about keeping things in a narrow homeostatic range. Now let's talk about a really fun experiment or investigation you could do um, around this feedback loop. So you might wanna use what's called a spirometer. A spirometer can either be a digital or analog device and you connect it to your mouth so you would breathe through it. And if we want all the air going through our mouth, then we also want to clamp off our nose here. But that spirometer is going to usually, especially if it's digital, is going to attach to some kind of screen or data logging device. And as you're breathing through here, what it's going to do is it's going to track your breaths over time. So we'll be able to see when we breathe in and when we breathe out and when we breathe in and when we breathe out. If you start exercising while you are using this spirometer, we should notice two things. One is that we breathe more deeply, so we're getting more air into our body at that um, during each breath, you know, bronchodilation, and we are breathing more frequently. So I'm going to have deeper breaths that occur more times per minute. And so this is a really fun activity and experiment that I highly recommend you check out um, using these things called spirometers. So we've talked about how hormones and nerves can both integrate and help organs or organ systems work together. Now we'll end this video with talking about how two different divisions of our nervous system can work together to accomplish both voluntary and involuntary movements. And I really wanna focus in on this super cool thing that happens in our digestive system called peristalsis. So our digestive system looks like this. We have an esophagus that leads into our stomach and our small intestines and our large intestines, and it is one continuous muscular tube. You're actually hollow on the inside. The way that we get food to move through that tube is not by gravity. It's through a series of muscle contractions. So peristalsis um, is this wave of muscle contractions, and there are going to be two types. There's going to be a muscle contraction behind the food to kind of squeeze it, and then a muscle contraction along the food to force the food through the tube. So you can actually eat, not that I recommend this, but you can eat and digest hanging upside down because it's really that um, muscle movement that's moving things through your digestive tract. What does this have to do with our nervous system? Well, we don't have to think about doing that now, do we, okay? There are certain parts of this digestive system that are voluntary and certain parts that are involuntary. 
Voluntary parts of our digestive system movements are going to be controlled by our central nervous system. So we're talking about brain and spinal cord. And there are two parts here of digestion that are voluntary, only two. So you have the initiation of swallowing, so that muscle movement at the back of your throat that swallows things. And at least after you're toilet trained, you have control over defecation. So you can actually control the muscles in your anal sphincter that control whether or not you feel like having a bowel movement or not. That is all voluntary. So if we think about what's voluntary, only what's happening here and here is voluntary. Everything else that's happening um, with, regarding this muscle movement, this peristalsis through your digestive tract is all involuntary. And it is not controlled by your CNS, your central nervous system. It is controlled by something called your enteric nervous system. So this is going to extend from your central nervous system and be carried along through nerves to the parts of your digestive tract. So there are nerves connecting to the muscles that control peristalsis and those nerves that is all involuntary movement, okay? So this is gonna include moving that food through the digestive tract and even defecation like very early in life when we are babies. So again, it's another great example of interaction and interdependence here in theme C, not only have we seen hormone and nervous systems integrate, but now we're even seeing different divisions of the nervous system and how they must work together to achieve the common goal of digestion.